All right. Okay, guys. So I'm going to start this live by actually training one of my dogs. So we're going to go out in the field, going to train one of my dogs, and then we'll actually get into the normal kind of live format that we got going on. I'm training live, baby. You just go on the field, I'll be right there. There's a lot of myths out there about why we use e-collars in training. Now, I'm not talking today about pet training. Pet training, I mean, I'll jump into it when we get into the later parts of the live, but a lot of people seem to believe that we can't train the behaviors without the e-collar. And the reason why we're using the e-collar is because we just can't train the So somehow if you magically apply electricity to whatever behavior you want to call it, you know, not that the e-collar gives electricity, it actually creates muscle contractions, but Point B, um, that you need this device in order to teach the behavior. And that's actually not true. So this female here, I've talked about her before, this is Bang, right? Now she's, I think, like 10, 11 months old. Eh, maybe 10 months old. I can never remember her age exactly. Anyways, as I said before, she's a little bit more medium in the drive. She's a little bit more of a lazy, easily distracted kind of dog. Not like hyper biddable, easy to train kind of dog. More of a type of dog that can be a little bit frustrating for training, but she has not been on an e-collar for this type of training ever until today. So today you guys are gonna see literally the first session, like how we're going to be training. I've hooked my e-collar up to a sound box so you guys can hear. After I'm done training her, then we're going to, um, we're going to do a Q and A and then we'll talk about some other stuff. So I'm just gonna situate her and then I'm gonna grab my toy quickly. Like, Okay guys, so not only is it her first day doing this type of training with an e-collar, um, I've also hooked it up to a sound box. So it's probably gonna create some level of distraction for the dog, because she's already a bit of an easily distracted dog, but this is the exact kind of dog that I love using the e-collar for. I don't use the e-collar because I have to use the e-collar. I use the e-collar because it makes things better, right? It makes things better, it improves things, right? Just like any good training tool, it improves things. Do I have to use this ball? No, I don't have to use this ball. I could use another type of ball. Right? There's a reason I'm using this specific ball with this specific dog, that specific leash. There's a lot of different reasons that I'm using specific tools at specific times in the training. So, without further ado, I'm gonna bring her over here where I have a mirror so I can kind of see what's going on. And we're gonna get started. into every behavior. But I taught the behaviors in a very specific way, with food and with leash and flat collar. Up. Good. Good. 
Those of you on my Patreon and in my online courses know exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. sloppy it's a little like oh you know she's learning still how to move with me and all that stuff but when you guys see the final picture and it's all nice you know now you don't have to make like assumptions about like how it happened I know like I said before a lot of trainers oh a lot of trainers come on baby Woo! a lot of trainers like to only show the nice clean repetitions the nice finished pictures. I show you guys that stuff too, but I love showing the process because the process is actually what's interesting. Oh, 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 oh. am I? Yes, good girl. Yes, yes, good job. Yes. Out. Yes, you guys can hear my e-collar, right? Ooh. Out. Oh. Yes, get that shit. Yeah, good job. Leak shot. Out. Yes, good girl. Very nice. The way I'm using the e-collar right now is I want gas. her first day on the collar, right? And this isn't perfect training because this is real life training, not, you know, the training for Instagram and Facebook and edited training for YouTube. This is real training. Oh. and everything will be half-assed and it will depend completely on how she's feeling that specific day. Stimulation or anything else, 
you'll see a bit of a regression. <laughs> Oh, very nice. Good girl. Okay, and that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> Hold on. Oh. Baby! Woo! Come on, baby girl. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Oh. Good girl. Bang! Phone. All right. And we call it. All right. Here's the call report. Huh? The call. Oh yeah, give me the call. All right. Thank you. Okay. How heavy is Bang? I think she's like probably around 60 pounds right now. She's not gigantic yet. She's like her line always matures a little bit later. They they mature mentally later. They mature physically later. Um, hold on guys, just give me one second. I'm just gonna take my vest off because I'm hot. So, the reason I wanted to show that, well, two reasons, number one, there's no like, the big thing with this is like, there's no secret with an e-collar training. You know, it's not like, you know, a lot of people think it's like just horrible stuff all the time. Now don't get me wrong. There is definitely um, times when, you know, it, you, and I don't care whether it's e-collar training or any other kind of training. I've spoken about stress before and how it's important to implement it as part of the training process, how you can use it to fix problems, how can you, you can use it to incentivize the dog to work harder. I've spoken about all these things. I'm not gonna maybe jump back into it to the same depth and degree that I have in the past. There's no point. Um, but, and you could see even in that session, there was some stress, there was some lack of sureness and that's okay. I don't know why people like are as afraid of this. There's a lot of trainers, I guarantee you, even the force free trainers, they will never, never show you the stress their dog experiences in training. They only show you the nice clean reps and are many balanced trainers as well. And they will never show you the truth, but there are many moments when the dog is unsure. The dog doesn't do the right thing. The dog does the wrong thing. It doesn't look good. The dog gets scared. The dog gets suppressed. The dog, you know, just has a shitty day and they don't show you this. And then when people are training their own dog, 
They feel so inadequate. They feel so insecure because they're like, well, what the fuck? It doesn't look like, you know, Mr. Superstar dog trainer on the internet, you know, who's showing me only the perfect reps with a dog that already knows the exercises he's demonstrating. I hate that stuff, right? I got no problem like flexing with a nicely trained dog because it's a work of art. It's just like if you're an artist and you paint a beautiful picture, you wanna show people your fucking picture. Yes, it's beautiful, I painted it, blah, blah, blah. But I like to show how we paint the picture so people can have a realistic idea of what's involved in the process. So there you saw some sport training, okay? Now I know a lot of you guys are just the pet people, which is fine too, right? Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about e-collar training because listen, I constantly, it's con and it will never end, right? It doesn't matter how many lives I do on this, how many times I talk about it in depth, give information, so on and so forth. People will always question the use of the e-collar. In their mind, it's like, for them, it's like magic because the people that question it don't know how to use it, right? So for them, it's magic. It's like, it's like, oh, I don't need magic to train my dog. I can just train my dog with hot dogs and a leash and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, stupid. No, everybody can do that. The point is, what is the e-collar bringing to the table that is going to improve the performance of the given dog? Now, there are some types of dogs where the e-collar, you can literally just use it once in a blue moon as a corrective measure. But that's not how I train with the e-collar. For me, the e-collar, you remember that hot sauce commercial like with the old lady, she goes, I put that shit on everything. That's what I do with the e-collar. I put that shit on everything because it makes it better. It improves, as when we're, especially when we're talking about sport training, okay? Pet training, that's, that's a no brainer. But sport training, it makes it better. It's a wireless leash. That's all an e-collar is, right? So all the things, if you watch carefully, all the things I'm doing with the e-collar I've already done with the leash. She already understands it from that context, right? If you don't put the work in with the leash and the food and you know all of this type of stuff, if you don't go through a system that shows progressive, you know, that, that progressively builds the dog and teaches the dog how to be resilient to pressure and deal with the pressure, you know, it's then of course you put the e-collar only, some people just use it as like a big hammer. Oh, you're not listening, e-collar, right? And you can certainly use it like that, but that's only ha like that's like a tiny percentage of what you can do with the e-collar. So there was a lot of, give me a second, let me light this up. Hold on a second, guys. Let me turn on my uh, device here. There we go. So I posted a video recently of myself and Chico, okay? And I'm just doing sit down stand with that dog. Very different dog than Ben, much higher in the drive. And for those of you that have experience, and listen, a lot of the people that comment on these videos so on and so forth, they don't have experience, which is part of the problem. So here's the thing with, ben, with uh, Chico, extreme drive. And what the extreme prey drive does to him is it creates tension in the muscles. And the tension in the muscles means that the dog is so hyper fixated and obsessed with the prey that he, it inhibits the way he moves actually, because it creates like a, a tension, a lock in the muscles. So oftentimes for exercises like the sit, it can create a slow sit where the dog goes and then like slit, sits like a very slow hydraulic press, you know? Um, and other behaviors like that. And for me, it's very important that the dog is able to function and offer the behaviors correctly even under the highest level of drive, which is why you sh see me putting the electric collar on simple behaviors like sit, stand, and down. Now there's people, oh, you don't need an e-collar to teach sit, stand, and down. Yeah, I'm not teaching sit, stand, and down. I was fixing his sit, stand, and down. And that is a very different thing than teaching a sit, stand, and down, right? So. A lot of people assume that, you know, just because you're using it, you can't do it without it or, you know, uh, somehow like there's the, like the, the using it will just magically train the dog to do it. Trust me, I don't care. Put it on a human being and make electric and tell them to do something in a language they don't understand. I guarantee you they're not going to come up with the solution, right? It's the same with the dogs. It doesn't work, okay? It's only, it, it's literally like that hot sauce commercial right? You put it on to make things better. 
It's not a replacement for training. It's only an enhancer of training. And that's what so many people don't understand with the e-caller. And they never will understand because their minds are closed. And again, we live in a generation where everybody talks on the internet without actually doing. So guys, I know I was missing a lot of stuff just because I was training. So I'm just gonna jump to the beginning here. I see you all jumping on here. This is from Maddie Kylie. My dog nearly refuses to poop with me only once to with dad. He'll stand there till his feet are frozen. I'm at the wit's end and tried everything from reward to no nonsense to letting him sniff. He'll hold it all day or more to poop with dad. Well, if he poops with dad, let him poop with dad. As long as he's not shitting on the ground, who cares? You know, I thought you were gonna tell me he's shitting on the gar, the ground. This is uh, this is another Havana castle. Did anyone else see the recent play video with his three dogs? I can't get over how Big Bang is already. Yeah, she's a good sized female and her mother was too. That line is all blocky. They're all very nice, strong dogs. I really like the, the look and, and the, 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 the depth in that line that, that Bang comes from. So I bred Swamp. You guys, some of you guys know Swamp. I bred Swamp to Bang's half-brother. Bang's half-brother is owned by my friend, Ann Lee. Um, and uh, she, uh, the half-brother looks a lot like Bang. Black, you know, social, open dog. And again, he has that deep, deep pedigree and he's DM clear and Swamp is a carrier. If Swamp wasn't a carrier, I would have bred her to Chico, but you never breed two DM carriers together. So um, I bred Swamp to Yarrow Bum Eisenkrauts and I'm really excited for that breeding. I think we're gonna have some really nice puppies from that. I really hope Bang is DM clear because if she's DM clear and not a carrier, uh, I will breed her to Chico. I think that combination will be just absolute fire. I think my next competition dog will come from that combination if she is indeed clear. I also have Chico's niece. You guys don't really know Chico's niece. Chico's niece is just like Chico, like looks the same, just very female version of, of him and super, super extreme drive. So Chico's niece also very much excites me for breeding. Now I ask you this, this is the stuff guys, I'm sharing this shit for free. So please do me a favor, just like the video because when you like the video, it helps me in the algorithm and it makes it worthwhile for me to continue to do things like this. So all I'm doing is I'm showing you my training, I'm answering your questions for free. You know, obviously there's always still preference to uh, elite members. So if you're one of my elite members, of course I will um, I will give preference to your question, those people that are in my online courses, but it literally costs you absolutely nothing to hit that like button. Hit the damn like button. Chico weighs, uh, I don't know, I haven't weighed him. If I had to guess, he's probably about 85 pounds. As you inspire me, I'm going to college, and when I get done, I'm going to start my journey of training dogs professionally. Thank you for the videos. Awesome. I'm happy to hear it, man. That's great news, and I wish you much success. <laughs> I have money, man. I want to... Listen, if, you, if you're interested in purchasing a dog, you hit us up. Uh, on email via the website, you don't, uh, you don't uh, ask me on a live. It's just not the place to talk about that stuff. Any thoughts on American Nikitas for family? I heard they're stubborn but loyal. They are extremely stubborn. Eileen, how you doing? Bang loves her daddy. Yes, she does. A bit. She's actually, of all my dogs, she probably loves me the least. And that's just her personality. She's just not... She's very much a self-satisfier. I know a lot of people don't see it, but if you can compare her to my other two dogs, you see it, right? The other two dogs are like obsessed with me. Bang is like, ah, you know, she'll play with me. She'll do stuff with me, but it's not like, I need to do this all the time, right? 
So for her, using the e-collar, so let me talk about why with a dog like Bang, using the e-collar is gonna make her in about a year's time after we really put the e-collar in and we build the, the mindset with the e-collar that we want her to have, it is gonna make her look like a unit on the field. So if I was to, if I keep her, and I'm still not sure yet, like I might put her in a co-owned home, but if I keep her and continue to train her and I prepare her for competition, in eight months to a year, she's gonna be unrecognizable and you guys are gonna be like, oh my God, like this dog is crazy, this dog is high drive, this dog's a maniac, you know, this dog's just such an awesome working dog. And it's, that's the power of using the e-collar correctly. Gas, 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 baby, gas, gas, gas. And a lot of people don't know how to use it as gas, they only know how to use it as, as a big hammer to correct the dog for doing things they don't want the dog to do. And listen, in a pet trading context, it's fine. So like for me, the dog's like 10 months old. This is the first time I'm really using the e-collar in a sport training context. Why? Well, I don't live in the suburbs. I don't live in the city. You know, I can be out on the farm with her. Um, I don't need to worry that she's going to run off and she's never going to come back or she's going to go hit, get hit by a car or anything like that. So for me, you know, I don't need her e-collar training. Now, if she was a pet, like if, she, if I was living in a suburban neighborhood, for instance, and the dog was living in the house with me, well, for me, it's very important to be able to take my dogs off leash because it's the best way for them to exercise. It's best for them. It's best for you, obviously. You know, it's uh, I don't walk my dogs on the leash unless they're like really young puppies. So for me, of course, I will e-collar train the recall right away. And she does have a recall on the e-collar. It's uh, We did it about maybe a month ago, month and a half ago. We just did a recall on the e-collar so she could be walked in the woods off the leash and we wouldn't have to worry she's gonna run after a coyote or something. And she's that kind of dog that like, very distracted dog, like will go after something and ignore you completely. You know, some of the dogs that we train, especially when you train them from puppy onwards, they become obsessed with you. She's not one of those. She's one of those dogs. If you didn't know what you were doing with her, she would be extremely frustrating to train. But training functional obedience and training sport are two very different things. And the way we use the e-collar is very different. Chandra, you're on here. Good to see you. Hmm. The thing is the e-collar itself doesn't make her different, right? Teaching her the foundation with the leash. So those of you in my Patreon, you guys have seen all the work I was doing. Those of you in my online courses, the power positions, the focus healing course, all of those courses, the secret sauce course, you guys know what I was doing. You guys know what I've been doing the last 10 months with that dog to get her to the point that when I put the e-collar on, it goes as well as it went in the session, right? There's a lot of pre-work that goes into it. So that when you put the e-collar on, it's hot sauce. It's not, oh, you know, oh, now she, how's she gonna work through this? Anthony asks, gold member, how often should I train in building arousal with my defensive based dog, I don't know how much is too much. Anthony, are you talking about in protection work? In protection work, um, there's nothing wrong with it as long as you're making the transition to prey. And obedience, again, it depends on the dog. So you'll notice for like a dog like Bang, I do a ton of arousal. I need to make, I need to do a lot of secret sauce with Bang to build her to the point where she's willing to work past, you know, her distraction. Sorry guys. Anyways, um, what was I saying before I got cut off here? Oh, we were talking about how much arousal is too much. So with dogs like um, Gage and with dogs like Bang, arousal is the secret to getting those dogs to perform, right? Whereas a dog like Chico, too much arousal is actually gonna hurt, right? Because Chico's drive is so, extre so extreme that if I drive his arousal high, it can get a little dicey for me and also it's gonna make him too vocal in the obedience and it's not gonna be productive.
Joyful Canine Services says, there's no higher skill than the sport dog world. So valuable, not my thing as a lifestyle, but its benefits bleed into any dog owner. Plus, has is incredibly talented. Thank you very much. Here's my thing, right? If I was into cars, I'd be into some form of competition with cars, right? Like, let's say, I don't know, like my life's work was to sell cars at a dealership or something, right? Well, then guess what? I'm racing cars too. Because whatever it is that you do, you got to look for the competition in that area because the competition is where you're going to grow. It's going to force you to always grow because everybody else, you know, is doing that stuff. And it forces you other with other people that are in a similar or same field as you to compare your skills, to compare your abilities and to upgrade, upgrade, upgrade or be left behind. And that's the fantastic thing about dog sport is as a dog trainer, there is no better way to improve your skills. Pet dog training is great and I've been doing it for well over a decade. You know, they're just, the reality is there just isn't much I haven't seen with the pet dog training side of things. It's not that there's never anything left to learn there, but it's a very simple procedure. Pet training, behavior modification, it is a simple procedure, right? And once you've been through it, you know, as many times as I've been through it, you start looking for a little more, which is why I do the sport dog thing. I think you mentioned it, but you used the e-collar to amp the dog up even when she didn't do something completely wrong. I wasn't using the e-collar when she was wrong, right? That's not why we use the e-collar. I'm not using it because she was wrong. I was layering the e-collar into behaviors. That's two very different things. I wasn't making, sometimes for sure, like the dog was maybe making a slight mistake or not being as fast as she should be, but the e-collar is not just for when the dog is wrong. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. What do you say is the minimum weight for a personal protection dog? I've sold a 50 pound police dog um, in 2023. Listen, when you're getting bit, when that thing's coming for you, you're not gonna be picky about, oh, is it 60 pounds? Is it 80 pounds? People get too obsessed with these things. It's not that important. Personally though, I do prefer more substantial dogs. Um, and uh, I often have larger dogs that are, you know, between 80 and 100. Uh, but I've still not, I will not say no to smaller dogs either, as long as the dog has the right pieces, the right mental, the, the right character, the right drive. I just got a Caucasian of Charka puppy last week. How soon do I start training her? And how exactly am I to train her as she's my first puppy? Like I say to everybody, you need to follow a training plan, right? It just so happens I happen to have a training plan. It's called the Puppy Foundations course. It's called the Elite Off Leash course. You can follow those courses with your dog, shieldk9online.com, the link's gonna be in the description below. Um, you can't just go out there and be like, well, has said this one thing on his live, so I'm gonna go and do that. It's not gonna work for you. You need step-by-step -step processes to follow to train the dog to actually get her where you wanna get her. I lost a dog to DM, yeah. That's the problem, you know. Unfortunately, DM is a common problem in the German Shepherd. And there are DM affected dogs. Those are dogs that have two copies of the recessive trait that is DM. And then there are DM carriers. DM carriers carry one copy. So about, I would say 50, 60% of German Shepherds carry one copy of the gene for DM. But it's not an effect. It's just like if you carry um, a copy of a gene for like blue eyes, but you have brown eyes right? You have one copy. So let's say you made a baby with someone else that also carried that recessive trait for blue eyes. You guys both have brown eyes, but you can have a blue eyed baby. It works the same way for DM and a lot of other recessive traits like, you know, a long coat or something like this. So actually long coat might be code dominant. I can't recall. Anyways, point being DM is a recessive trait. Now there are some arguments about, you know, whether you know, some care, like the, the, the veracity of the DM test, if it's legit, if it's not, some people don't believe in it. But the point is DM is a disease that affects the rear end of the German Shepherd and can cause back issues later in life. 
Of course, we want to avoid it. So you never breed two carriers together. You breed a carrier to a clear or a clear to a clear. You never breed um, a carrier to a carrier or you never, of course, breed an affected dog. Can you help me? I get bullied in school. Well, just like uh, dogs, okay, James, James, I assume you're a dude. Um, just like dogs, uh, human beings are very primal creatures. And the younger they are, I find the more primal they are, right? Um, so they're, they're very close to nature. When you watch kids with each other, they're ruthless. Now, I don't know what um, age you are, my friend, but I'm gonna tell you this. There is no other solution to bullying than to fight fire with fire. And I'll tell you this as someone who did experience some, at some points in my life, people that, you know, chose to take that liberty with me, there's only one way out. It's not hiding, it's not avoiding, it's not telling the teacher. You gotta throw those hands, my friend. And if you don't know how to throw those hands and you, you know, you have that sick, terrified feeling in your stomach, what you do is you go to a gym where they teach you how to throw those hands and you learn how to throw those hands and you get comfortable. You get comfortable getting punched in the face. You get comfortable getting sat down. You get comfortable getting rocked and you get comfortable delivering those hands to other people. And then you do what you need to do to protect yourself. That's the only way, my friend. It doesn't get any better. And if you do the wrong thing, if you, you know, let's say you run away or you hide or you tell the teacher, that will stick with you for the rest of your life. I promise you that. So you, you should be happy. You're getting bullied. It's an excellent opportunity now to prove to yourself, right, who you are as an individual. You're either the person that's, oh, please, no, stop, or you're, no, man, it's not going down. It's not going down like that, right? But your daddy should be telling you this. From learning dogs, it seems you can't just have fun with dogs like we did as kids. You always have to do everything properly. Anyway, to have like playful fun without ruining training? No, you can for sure. I let my dogs jump on me. I let my dogs mouth me. I throw, you know, the ball for my dogs. You, I take my dogs for walks. You can do all of these things. Here's the problem. What a lot of people don't do is they don't have the other side. They don't have the training. So they can't control, you know, allowing the dog to do all of these things that can sometimes lead to negative side effects. If you have no control over your dog, yeah, you can't let your dog jump up on you because you have no way to make him stop. If you have no control of your, over your dog, you can't let him jump on the couch because the potential side effects of the dog jumping on the couch, maybe starting to resource guard, all these types of things. So yes, you can allow more, you actually have more freedom to do more things with your dog, the more control you have over your dog. The less control you have over your dog, well, yeah, you can't do all of that stuff because the potential side effects are significantly more. So this is why a lot of dog trainers and a lot of dog training literature tell you, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, because they know that you are gonna screw it up and you won't be able to recognize, oh, this is going too far, I need to stop it now. I play really rough with my dogs, but I know when it's starting to go too far, you know? Here's the thing with, with dogs, dogs like kids. You ever watch kids play with each other? They're roughhousing, roughhousing. All of a sudden, somebody gets a little bit too hurt. Either someone's crying or fists are being thrown because the play became a little too intense. Somebody took it personally and things escalated. It's the same with the dogs, right? James says, can I get, is any age too soon to start puppy training? Eight weeks is a good age, my, I like eight weeks to start puppy training. Oh, James, you're a troll. That's all right, James. That's all right. Somebody, somebody I'm sure might, uh, might gain something from, from what I said. If I could block you, I would, but unfortunately, I just don't have the uh, time right now. All right, let's see what else we got here. Is it best to feed raw food? Um, I think raw food has its benefits. Um, raw food has its benefits, 
But for me personally, with my sport dogs, I feed Royal Cannon. Um, I feed my breeding dogs raw food. I find raw food tends to make less shedding and smaller, uh, uh, smaller stool. So, and the stool of course dries up and powders, goes to powder a lot faster. Um, but in terms of like overall health, I haven't seen there to be a difference. What I have seen is some dogs benefit more from one and some dogs benefit more from the other. Like I've seen some dogs, they just can't keep the weight on with raw. And I've seen some dogs that, um, you know, they really, like their stomach is, is, is a little more sensitive and they do very well with raw. Is my new book available yet? No, it's not. Sorry guys, I'm just going through here, looking for some good questions. All this pointy eared biting and tugging. It's exhausting. How about breaking out one of your high drive working line field labs and show how to incorporate obedience outing? Bro, if you can train a pointy ear, field lab is nothing. We love the hunting dogs here. Field labs, German short air pointers, golden retrievers, uh, Chesapeake Bay retrievers. I love those dogs. Those dogs are a walk in the park. What we call those dogs in the training industry is easy money. There's no challenge in it. They're so easy. If you could train a pointy ear, uh, a, a lab is like a walk in the park. You know, it's it's nothing complicated. It's this exact same concepts. You know, everyone's like, oh, show me, show me how you play with a with a bully. I play with a bully the same way I play with my um, with, with with bang. Show me how you play with this dog. With I sh I play the same way, right? Now, I might say, oh, this dog likes fighting with me more. So I'll, just like my YouTube video, again, completely free, put it up there on YouTube. Just like my YouTube video, I might say, oh, well, this dog really likes fighting with me, so let me fight with him. This dog really doesn't like fetch, so I'm not going to really throw the ball for him. Or this dog loves fetch, so I'm going to throw the ball for him. Or this dog loves to carry it, and he likes to growl at me and stare me in the eyes while we play tug and really like feel like he's defeating me. No problem. Every dog has the... Thing that gets them going but fundamentally play is play is play people need to stop with this well show me how you train that breed and this it's the same fucking thing caucasian of charka great dane akita all of it's the same thing the fundamental principles of dog training don't change is there different thresholds different drive levels different levels of nervous system you know uh different levels of physical sensitivity for sure but the fundamental principles do not change, which is why you see all the people in my online courses all around the world with various different breeds of dog. And there's a girl with like two Akitas um, in Austria or something. And she's always posting off leash videos, you know, with those dogs. There's a guy with a boxer. There's a guy like, there's just, there's that. There's Ian with like the four, four or five like uh, Huskies or Malamutes. It's like, it's the same exact concept guys. My cigar is out. Too much talking. Do I condition the e-collar like most do? Do you believe you need to condition prior to implementation high-level corrections? What's your goal with the e-collar? Did you see any high-level corrections with bang? You know, I'll tell you this, if I lived in Europe, if I lived somewhere where e-collars were illegal, I would only use it as a hammer. And I would only use it very occasionally just to clean up training. I would teach everything with just the leash and the flat or the leash and the choke or something like this. And then I would just use the e-collar to clean everything up. And I would, I would never condition it. I would never condition it because the goal there is to just use it literally as, as, um, you know, uh, uh, a thunderbolt from God for your disobedience, right? 
if that was my goal with it, but I don't live in a place that I have to do that with it, right? I can use it um, in all its glory. I can use all aspects of the e-collar. I can use it openly in training. I don't have to hide it. I don't have to pretend. It's a fantastic training device. Like I said before, it is a wireless leash. And the whole point in 2024, whether it's with your computer, with your phone, whatever it is, wireless baby. It's 2024, we're wireless. Josh says, oh. Elite member, once a dog is fully pet obedience trained, does the dog consider the release a reward itself? Avoiding pressure is motivation. Please share your thoughts. Josh, for many dogs, the answer is yes. The release of the pressure is the reward and the break from the behavior is the reward. And if you want that to be a reward, by all means, you can definitely do that. Um, but your reward, I encourage people that that shouldn't be your only reward if you can make alternative rewards, whether it's praise, play directly with you, play with the toy, play with the food, um, do that as well. Elite member, when correcting a dog for disobeying a command, should you use no, creating suppressive behavior? Only once the dog... Um, only so you only use no oh you're talking about reactive yeah absolutely you use no for reactivity right reactivity is is, is punishment is, is you must punish this behavior there's no situation under which reactivity would be acceptable so for sure guys there's 177 people watching this and only 60 likes get those likes up i'm gonna smoke my cigar while i watch those likes go up or i'm gonna end it here i don't care You know, a lot of people hit me up for free training. They call me, they message me, you know, and they try to get free training. And it's crazy to me, you know, it's, it's absolutely wild to me because it's like, I literally, a lot of the questions these people will ask me is exactly what I put for free on YouTube. I put it for free on YouTube, right? And people will literally ask me that, they'll call me up. They'll message me and they'll ask me a question that I answer completely for free on YouTube. And they'll expect me to take time out of my day to help them absolutely for free. It's like, do you know how long I had to work to learn the things I had to, to learn the things that I, I learned when it comes to, dog, when it comes to dog, dog training? I seem to have mush mouth now. Like it, it took a lot of time, it took a lot of work. Like I don't call a plumber, right? Or I don't know, let's think of something maybe a little more sexy than a plumber. I don't know. What's more sexy than a plumber? But still, you know, like they have, they have to do a job. <laughs> I'm, I'm drawing a blank. All right. Oh, horse trainer. I don't call a horse trainer. I don't call my horse trainer. And I say, look, man, I'm not paying you. I have this problem with my horse. Um, I know that you've been studying this for the last 15 years. And, you know, you've been riding, you know, you've ridden, you've ridden a thousand horses. You've fallen off horses. You've learned the hard way. You've learned the easy way. You've spent untold thousands, hundred probably thousand dollars in your education. And you know, you've put all this time and effort in and I have this problem with my horse and uh, hey, help me fix it for free. I'm just gonna call you up, help me, hip, help me fix it for free. I would never do that. That's absolutely insulting. You know, that's, that's insulting and that's thoughtless, right? And it shows a lack of commitment, especially when the answer is available for free on YouTube. I'm not even talking about my videos. There are, there is countless, countless hours of YouTube content in relation to dog training and dog behavior available for free on the internet. Now, granted, a lot of it is absolute nonsense, but a lot of it's also really good stuff and it's completely for free. If you put the time and effort into just studying, right? You don't have to be rich, right? You Maybe you're broke, you don't have any money but you have this dog and you wanna train this dog or you have this dog and you have a behavioral problem with the dog. Instead of just reaching out to the first guy you see on the internet and trying to try to you know, kind of mooch off of him and get him to help you for free, instead, why don't you invest your time? If you can't invest your money, invest your time. Invest your time, right? If you don't have any money, you should have plenty of time. So get on the internet and find out you know, how to fix the problem that you have. Put the time and the effort in. And if you're not gonna do that, 
That's probably why your dog has the problems it has in the first place. Hi, Has. We're currently in classes at Guelph. In regards to Rottweilers, are the ones with insane dry food ball prey, are they all destined to be dog aggressive? Well, um, you know, it's not about the drive. Drive doesn't make your dog dog aggressive. Um, drive just makes your dog have drive. I've seen plenty of dogs with drive that are very social. And I've seen plenty of dogs with no drive that are I extremely uh, uh, reactive or, or extremely dog aggressive. Dog aggression is something that's very common in certain breeds. Uh, male Rottweilers tend to carry it a fair bit, and female Rottweilers. Pressas, Mollusers, Bullies. You see the, a lot of dog aggression in these breeds for a reason. Am I Italian? No, I'm not. Tara says, hi, Haz, do you have any advice, points, or cautionary tales for someone who's considering getting into IGP for the first time aside from joining clubs? Yeah, absolutely. You must find, um, like I say to every, anybody, in this day and age, there is like nothing for free. And being in a club is like pretty much being, it's pretty much free, right? You join the club, you pay 800 bucks for the year or whatever it is, which is really nothing. And, you know, you go to that club once a week or twice a week or whatever it is. And if you think you're going to learn how to train your dog and properly prepare your dog for sport doing that, good luck. You certainly will not. You need to find a coach. You need to find a mentor, whether it's online or in person, that has the success that you want to have, that has accomplished the goals or helped other people accomplish the goals you want to accomplish. And then you need to follow their training plan and their training system. And that will be the only way you have any kind of meaningful success in IGP. How would you like your, your dog to bite in real world protection scenario? Do you want to see it shake, calm, deep, or pull or push? Do you prefer specific body parts to target? In the real world scenario, I'm happy if my dog bites and if my dog is committed. This idea that your dog is gonna exhibit like perfect gripping behavior the same way they do on equipment in the real world is asinine, right? It doesn't happen. Watch police dogs bite. There's plenty of body cam footage available on YouTube if you, you know, you wanna watch that and you can see it. Um, you know, fundamentally, if I'm training my dog for the real world, I'm training him to counter in and I'm training him to deal with the emotions that he's most likely gonna feel in that type of scenario. And it's not gonna be the same emotion that he feels doing recreational bite work on the field or in the facility, or even if you're doing civil work with a muzzle or whatever it is, it's gonna be a very different experience. Turn to Christ before it's too late. That's an interesting comment. I'm a Muslim, so I turn to God, even though we uh, respect, uh, you know, Jesus, or we call him Isa alayhi salam. Uh, we respect him as a prophet of God. But I, I agree with you in the sense that you should turn to God and, you know, follow, follow the, the way God wants you to live as much as you can follow it. I think that's a healthy thing. I think it would make the world that we live in a much better place. Uh, very curious, when is your birthday? <laughs> Tara, I'm not telling you when my birthday is. Don't worry about it. I used to train with a decoy who didn't participate in bite sports. Her lack of skills in troubleshooting and building a dog in bite work was glaring. Suffice to say, I no longer train with them. There are many decoys like this. Oh, I'm just, I just train real dogs. I just train real, I don't do that sporty stuff. And whenever I would see people say that nonsense, I always just like laugh. I was like, yeah. So you're telling me you don't compete against other people. You never compare your skills in an objective manner. You know, you don't know, you don't have the talent 
necessary to actually build a dog to bite in a certain way and to do things a certain way, right? So if you think about it, right, for bite sports, bite sports are all specific, whether it's French ring, PSA, IGP, there are specifics. The dog must do things in a certain way. The dog, it's not just if the dog does it, he must do it in a certain way in order to be successful. This is why bite sports, whether you're doing obedience, protection, tracking, whatever, will teach you more than just doing the thing for the real world. It'll teach you more because it's more specific. In the real world, if my dog grabs the guy and starts pulling him, it's not the end of the world. And many dogs in real life actually do that. Um, there's always this, this argument. Oh, should he push on the grip? Should he pull on the grip? In the real world, in many cases, you see the dog start to pull the, pull the, um, pull the perpetrator when the dog is set on the perpetrator, right? Or you'll see the dog thrashing, even though in, in, on the bite suit, he's countering nicely. Or you'll see the dog counter and then pull and then counter and then push and thrash and show all these different behaviors because it's the real world, right? But when you train for a sport, it's a very demanding thing because the dog must do certain specific things. It takes a lot of skill to be able to, it takes many years and a lot of skill to be able to learn how to manipulate the dog into doing specific things, especially when it's not natural to the dog. You have a dog that naturally pulls. You need to teach him to counter into the grip, to push into the grip. How do you do this? You have a dog that naturally wants to counter. You need to teach him to push. You have a dog that thrashes and chews on the grip. You need to teach him to have a full, stable, and calm grip because every time he chews, you lose points. You need to really understand the dog in such a depth to be able to affect the way he naturally wants to do something like biting whilst not losing the power and the performance that that dog is able to put out. And what pe people don't understand that unless they actually do it. And there's a lot of this. Love watching the pro trainer vids. Good luck, Brent. Who's Brent? Oh, is Brent the person in the course? I'm glad you like the pro trainer course. How is India according to you? I don't know, I've never been to India. Looks like dog training's growing there, which is a good thing. I like to see dog training growing in India. I see a lot of people in China training dogs. You know, what I feel about a specific political system is immaterial when we're talking about a country, you know, fundamentally. Um, I like seeing that dog training is growing all around the world, especially competitive dog training. It's, it's a beautiful thing to see. And the more people that get into it, the more competitive it's going to be and the better overall um, level we're going to see when it comes to people, uh, you know, producing uh, training results with their dogs. Curious how you're finding horse training versus dog training. Pressure reaction is so different between predator and prey animals. Yeah, absolutely, um, Amanda, that's a very good question. So I'm not a horse trainer. I have a horse trainer. I go and I ride with him on my horse. Um, you know, it's one of the thing with horse training, if it was all in hand work, I would be able to do it. Um, and I found that doing it, like as I started doing it, like just working in, in the, you know, in the round pen and stuff like this, it was pretty like easy to understand, pressure release, so on and so forth. No problems for me. The challenge with horse training is that you actually have to ride the horse. And this is a physical skill completely separate from just being able to make pressure and release because instead of making pressure and release just with your hands, you're making now pressure and release with your legs. And you also must maintain balance and you must you know, not fall off the horse and you must know how to move with the horse. And there's so much complexity. So for me, I don't had that, I didn't have that, you know, skill of riding and I have to develop it and I'm still developing it. I'm certainly a lot better than I was a few years ago. Um, you know, and I ride very infrequently. Um, but when I do ride, I always, you know, try and learn a little bit. And as I become more proficient as a rider, I'm able to influence the horse with pressure and release more efficiently because I'm not worried about falling off all the time, still sometimes, but not all the time. Like smoking is good. It is when it's cigars. They're very good.
Are your lungs black? No, I actually have fairly good cardio because I don't smoke cigars like 10 times a day. I smoke them once every few days and that's not gonna have a problem. That's not gonna cause a problem most likely. Uh, elite member, advice on helping a 14 month old German Shepherd work through fear at the vet. He doesn't like being touched by strangers so he'll growl. Do I correct and try to avoid conflict with obedience? Well, it's kind of hard to make obedience when you're <clears throat> holding the dog and the vet is poking and prodding. What are you gonna tell him to do, sit? What you do do, what I do do is I teach the dog to stand for inspection, right? I'll teach the dog to stand, I'll hold the dog's head and I'll have you know, a friend or somebody come around and pull the dog's legs and tail and touch them on the stomach and all this stuff. And if the dog, you know, becomes aggressive, no, I'll correct the dog, then we'll step back up and we'll do it again. Now, if my dog just quietly goes, but doesn't do anything, okay, fine. But if he starts really trying to amp up, for sure I'm gonna correct him for this. And we're gonna go through it. And I'm gonna counter condition him. I'm gonna correct him for acts of outright aggression. And I'm gonna reward him for success. And I'm gonna show him how to be successful in that um, context of standing while somebody pokes and prods you. Alexander says, my intact male follows around my fixed male and tries to mount him. No signs of aggression. Any advice? Stop allowing it. It's impolite behavior and it can lead to aggression down the road. Make video Doberman dog, how to teach guarding. I have a course on this. I'm not gonna make, you know, it, it, it's actually quite a process. It's not like, oh, one video, this is how you do it. Um, I have a, an in-depth course on how to teach a um, any type of dog and I do show Dobermans in it um, how to do protection work. And uh, if you wanna purchase that course, shieldk9online.com. Appreciate all the free stuff, by the way. I'm broke. I pay for Patreon, though. Yeah, and Patreon's not expensive. You don't have to be rich. What is it, five bucks a month or nine bucks a month, right? It's like nothing. And there's a lot of free stuff in there. Well, not free stuff. Of course, it's paid content, right? But if you pair that with all the stuff on my YouTube, you can figure a lot of it out, you know? I've, I've literally run into many people that just off my YouTube channel alone have figured out how to train their dog most of the way. Right? So again, my book, that's 20 bucks. Like there's a lot of cheaper options if you're motivated. Someone said off-brand Andrew Tate. Mm, I don't think so. Brent, oh, hey Brent. Brent McDonald, you're in the Shield Pro Trainer course. Uh, thanks for the lives, man. Such a value in them. Training my boy. Yeah, man. I put a lot of free stuff on the in the lives. You got to watch it through because I'll drop something here. I'll drop something there. I'll show something here. I'll show something there. But a lot of people don't have that patience. They need that instant gratification. Answer my question for free. Help me fix my dog in three sentences. You know, what magical device can I slap on my dog to fix all his problems? Has, do you take any of Ivan's courses? Just curious where you find value in continued ed education, even though you're educating yourself too. There's so many resources, it's overwhelming. I, I have always preached how important continuing education is. And I regularly go to seminars that other world-class trainers um, are having, and I'm always learning. Um, so it's, it's not something where I think I know it all and that's it. What are the pros and cons of training at home versus a facility? It's a good question, Anthony. The pros of training in a facility, I, I'm a big believer as soon as I could, as a professional dog trainer, I got myself a little facility. The pros of a facility are 
it's professional. You have a place specifically in which to ply your craft that is dog training. The cons of a facility are you've got to pay for the damn thing every single month. Um, so you need to make sure you have enough business to pay for the facility that you have. I think, you know, as with anything, it's important to be professional. And as a dog trainer, I think a big part of being a dog trainer is having a facility. Now, I know there's a lot of people that train out of their van or they just train out of their house. And in many cases, I find a lot of these people are very part time. When I do something that I really like, I'm all in on it. So for me, as soon as I could get a facility, I got a facility. And as you can see, if you followed me over the years, I continuously upgrade my facilities constantly, constantly. Most of the money I make training dogs, I spend back on my facilities, on my equipment, on all the things that help me train dogs here. Have I ever done PSA? No, I've not personally competed in PSA um, with, with uh, but I've certainly helped a fair few people at this point that do compete in PSA. Obedience is obedience, training is training. You know, if you know how to do it, you can certainly, you know, do it in a lot of different places. So just because I don't do PSA doesn't mean uh, I can't do that type of training. I have been doing that training actually fairly frequently. Has, do you use line breeding? Of course you, do, you use line breeding. Line breeding is how you set type. Scatter breeding is just scatter breeding, you know. You shouldn't, you, sh you need, if you know anything about breeding animals, you must do line breeding if you wanna set a type, if you wanna create traits that are prepotent, that pass from generation to generation. This is where the line breeding comes in. <coughs> Elite. No, sorry, I'm not talking about no reactivity. I'm talking about disobeying command. Ah, okay. So you're asking me if you should punish your dog for disobeying a command. The only time I will ever use punishment in obedience is when I know that my dog beyond a shadow of a doubt knows what it is that I am asking and has willfully and shown me in a clear and observable pattern um, several times that they are willingly ignoring a known command. That's when I'll escalate and, may, and punish the dog. Only in that circumstance. But in the training process, absolutely not. You cannot punish a dog, um, you know, into doing obedience because the very nature of a punishment is the removal of something, right? Um, now, some people would argue that escalating until the dog does the thing that you want, well, technically it would be negative reinforcement just with a very high level of pressure. But now we're getting into the weeds and it doesn't particularly matter. I understand what it is that you're saying. And the answer to your question is yes, but only under that circumstance. Absolutely, Cheryl. Has time is money, asking for free training, shows a lack of respect for both you and your time. No, absolutely. And it's like, Listen, a lot of people say, oh, where does Has get off saying things like that? I'll say things like that. I have no problem saying something like that because I guarantee you almost every time I talk to these people, they always, within like a few sentences, I can tell, you know, like that this individual is just someone that puts absolutely minimal thought, effort, and intention into any of the things that they do. And that is why they're calling somebody and asking for free training instead of going out there and obtaining the information, putting in a little bit of time. If they can't put in the money, put in the time and get that information. You know, it, it just, it's absolutely wild to me. And I would never do it to somebody else, so I don't understand, you know, I guess I do understand why, but for me, it's very inappropriate. I have a 17 year old min pin chihuahua. Any advice to people dealing with elderly dogs? They don't feel like training. Yeah, if it's elderly, if it's 17, just let it live its life. What are you trying to train it for? <laughs> At that age, they're not really doing a lot anyways. You know, let them enjoy their life. Let them enjoy their old age. 
I have like a 14 year old Chihuahua at home. She's got cataracts, you know, she, she's, you know, she, sometimes she falls down the stairs if we're not careful. She is ancient. I am not worried about her training. Uh, can a dog perceive a low level of stim as a positive? Can a dog differentiate between a low level of stim and a higher corrective stim? Are these stims different enough as to confuse the dog? Steve, the answer to those questions is yes, absolutely, right? Uh, it's all about classical conditioning, right? Pavlov rang the bell, gave the dog food, right? You can do the same thing with an e-collar. Has when you and your brother were grinding away back in the day, would you breed whelp everything, etc. yourself? Would you clean all the kennels and stuff yourself? No, we never hired. Of course, we didn't hire help at the start. I did everything myself, even before my brother. And then when my brother came, I, I, when my brother came and worked with me for a number of years, he helped me as well. But it was a long time before we hired help. Um, and it was only once we just had too many dogs that we couldn't train them all and look after them all. But I spent uh, quite a while cleaning kennels and doing all the small things that are necessary in order to ensure the animals are healthy and the facility is clean and orderly. Lisa says, elite member working on aggression with my two-year-old working line German Shepherd. I was told by a trainer it can never be fixed and neutering him will solve the problem. Lisa, avoid that person completely, okay? Um, have you ever had a dog that you couldn't fix dog on dog aggression? What are you talking about? In what context? There is not a single dog on this planet. There is not a single dog on this planet that is reactive to other dogs or has dog aggression or whatever that you can't get to behave themselves in the presence and proximity of other dogs. Are there some dogs that I wouldn't allow to play with other dogs 110%. But when we're talking about just existing around other dogs, being able to walk past other dogs, that is simple shit. That is easy to fix. All these times I'm always, and the fact that your trainer told you to neuter the dog and that that would fix the problem tells you all you need to know about their skill and ability and their understanding of dog behavior, right? Um, yeah, there's not a single dog out there that you can't get to behave in the presence and proximity of other dogs. You just need the right training. Um, I strongly suggest you either get that training or uh, if you're in the if you if you have my reactive course, I show you how to do it in the reactive course. It's really very simple. Kelly says, clubs didn't used to be for profit. It used to be the training director was your coach. Yeah, but who's the training director? And can they really coach? Because I've seen a lot of training directors try to coach and I just watch that shit and I'm like, what in the flying, what are they doing? At the end of the day, like just about any coach that's worth a worthwhile coach is actually gonna spend the necessary time to ensure that you progressively train the dog properly and build the correct foundation on the dog is not gonna be free. And they're not gonna be a training director at a club. They are most more than likely a professional dog trainer whose time you will have to pay for, online or in person. And we talk about back in the day, you see the quality of training back in the day, right? You can see what the, what the training looked like and you can see what the dogs look like and you can see what they look like now. Training has become very much, especially at a higher level, a endeavor for professionals. Hi there, I have a schnauzer cross who is very vocal and lately has become aggressive towards other dogs and barks at people. He used to be the complete opposite. How can I get him to stop? You must train him and you must correct him. More than likely your dog matured and a lot of the time people confuse, you know, a dog as a puppy 
maturing with what the dog is going to be as an adult. And in many cases, that's not the case. That's, that's not uh, at all the reality. Amirali Saidi says, Salam. Wa alaikum salam. Do I have any experience with King Corso and protection work? Yes, I do. Do I like the breed? Eh, it's quite possible. <laughs> I like some of them. I mean, again, when we're talking about protection work, they're not the dog for recreational bite work. Uh, many of them have nerve issues. Many of them have health issues. It's the same story with the Pressas. It's the same story with a lot of these off-breed dogs and they're off-breeds for a reason. Yeah, I see a lot of interesting people in the chat today. Anthony says, gold member, just wanted to say the work you did with the, with Beast de Balkan was amazing. Most press of breeders owners just walk and don't show any real work other than agitation. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. That dog was a little project for me. Um, and uh, he was an interesting dog to train. It was, uh, it was definitely an interesting build. But the process that I show in my courses, so you're a gold member, so you know you have access to all the courses, the process that I show, especially with a dog like a Pressa, right? If you want to create that drive, that energy, and that precision with a dog like that, you must do secret sauce, and then you must do the power positions and the focus healing that I show. That's how you get that performance, right? With a dog like that. Because he didn't really actually have that much drive. You know, that dog... His greatest thing, the thing that he loved to do the most was actually bark at me. Nadine Cowley says, gold member, my male Rottweiler just turned two, newly hesitant and unsure of children. How best to address before possibly escalating? Okay, Nadine. Here's the thing. Don't force it. Don't force it. As dogs develop and grow, sometimes you can see them become strange with something new, something that they, let's say before they didn't have a problem, then all of a sudden they develop a problem. In many cases, there actually was a pre-existing problem, but the, the signs were maybe so subtle that you didn't see it. Um, and then now the dog is just finally getting to the point where they're willing to express that there is a problem with whatever it is. So here's the thing that you need to do. What you need to do is, like I said, don't force it. Just allow your dog to become comfortable around kids, but don't allow the contact with the kids, especially strange kids. I'll tell you this. I don't care how friendly my dog is. I will not allow strange kids to ever touch my dogs, right? Now, my own personal kids, if the dog lives with me, that's a different thing. But if they are not, you know, if they are not living with me, if there are strange kids or family members that don't that visit sometimes, do not allow contact. That's the best way. Like, the, you know, you're just asking for something to happen. A lot of these breeds, the, you know, like the Roddies and the Mollusers and stuff like this, they do not, they're not comfortable with people they don't know. And a lot of the time people confuse toleration with comfort. And being tolerant is not the same as being comfortable. Hi, Haz. What's your opinion on Doberman breed and is it worth buying one for IGP or protection because I've got a European Doberman male coming? Well, Chris, why are you asking me? You already got one. <laughs> you got one. So you're, you're in for a penny, in for a pound. Hopefully it works out. Pretty good rider to be riding a stallion. I'll tell you this about stallions. You know, when I got the stallion, a lot of people were like, you have to geld him, you have to geld him, you have to geld him. And just like with dogs, I said, this is bullshit. And if someone's telling me that the, dog, the, the horse can't be trained because it's a stallion or, or they're afraid to train the horse or ride the horse because it's a stallion, that is not the trainer for me. So what did I do? I watched, again, listen, the internet is a fantastic resource. I, watch, I watched, um, the, you know, the horse is a PRE, Pure Raza Espanol, right? I'm sure I mispronounced it, but it is an Andalusian. It is an Iberian horse, right? And if you look at Spain and Portugal, where this horse originates from, these guys all keep them as stallions for the most part. And they ride them all around each other. Like, there'll be like five stallions going on a trail ride together or riding in the street, 
And they will do that or, or training in an arena. There'll be like four or five stallions. Oh, everybody just riding and training. And the stallions aren't causing a problem. They're just doing their work. They're just working, right? And I said, well, these people over here are doing it. How come we can't get it here? And luckily for me, first I found some Western guys. And the Western guys are more uh, comfortable with stallions and are used to working stallions, uh, especially like the Rainers and the guys that compete, right? The sport people. Uh, they were comfortable. So I, I had a couple of Western guys break my stallion, um, get him broken to saddle, walk, trot, canter. I went to a Rainer. He did some fantastic work. But I also was able to find a Portuguese guy that's here um, that actually learned in Portugal and you know has a classical equitation background. And he understands these horses intrinsically and he breeds Lusitanos. And now this is my trainer and he and I am riding my stallion around other stallions and it's not a problem. I'm riding him around mares and geldings and it's not a problem. Do I feel confident enough to do that by myself yet? No, but with him, absolutely. Got my French Bulldog starting some bite work this weekend. New meta for guard dog. Just wait. <laughs> That's funny. You know, Frenchies are suicidal. I love Frenchies. They're so brave. They're drivey. They're tough. They're stubborn. They're just really small and they have a lot of health issues, unfortunately. But I really like them. They're, they're very cute dogs and I love their, their mindset. Which method would you say is the most effective for odor recognition? I don't know, <laughs> detection training. Detection really isn't something that I, I, I'm, I'm interested in. Um, I understand the process by which you train it. Um, and I've seen it done and I've been to actually detection seminars and stuff like this. But I, I'm, I don't claim to be an expert in detection. I don't really have a lot of interest in it. Thank you for your live videos. I hope you know how valuable they are to us. I appreciate it, man. I'm glad you enjoy the, the lives. Just off your YouTube videos, I trained my 11 month old Pressa to have solid obedience. Awesome, Ross. That's what I like to hear, my friend. Guys, don't ask me about other places. Like, I just don't want to really uh, I, I don't really want to comment on like other, you know, content creators and stuff like that. Hey, has you took down your dog success mechanism video. Could you cover briefly this topic here? Thanks, Josh. I think we're kind of running out of time here, so I'm not going to talk about it today. Tara Gleason, gold member. I'm a long way off IGP, but my dog has begun to crave the basic obedience thanks to you awesome i'm happy to hear it what do i do with my half-brained italian greyhound that pees in the house <laughs> that pees in the house well you got to train the dog um you got to crate train that dog and then you got to follow a process of habituation where you prevent the dog from having free access to your house that they can just eliminate in your house and um and and you've got to create the habit see what you have to understand is dogs are habitual creatures I'll tell you what, I'll talk about the process of a house training, but I see we got 92 likes. I'm gonna wait till they hit 100. If they don't hit 100, I am gonna wrap it up because my cigar is done. And then I'll see you guys on the next one. If we get to 100 likes, I'll talk about how to properly retrain a dog that eliminates in the house. The reason why I'm being tough on likes is because when you aren't, it has an algorithmic, it has an algorithmic impact. And algorithm's important. If, especially if we're gonna do this kind of stuff for free and it costs you absolutely nothing to hit that like button. Hit the like button and I'll continue on.
All right, guys. Nice job. All right, so let's talk about how to fix a dog that eliminates in the house. So you've got a dog, it's an adult dog, it's eliminating in the house. Here's what you need to do, all right? First of all, remove the dog's free, free access to the house. That's number one, okay? The dog is free in the house and therefore he's making the decision at times to eliminate, whether it's on the carpet, whether it's in a specific corner or place. Usually you'll find that the dog likes one specific room or area in which to eliminate in the house. So what you need to do is remove the dog's free access to the house. Crate train the dog if the dog isn't crate trained or if the dog is crate trained, isolate the dog in the crate when you are not directly there looking after the dog. The other thing that you need to do is you need to place train the dog, okay? Um, I have free video on that. I show how to do that in more depth in my courses so you can see how to do that. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna have a dog that's crate trained and you're gonna have a dog that is place trained. Now, when you are home with the dog, your dog will not be wandering the home. The dog will be on the place bed. And that way you know where the dog is. And the place bed preferably will not be a soft material. It'll be like a canvas material. Because if it's a soft material, some dogs that are really dirty don't mind actually pissing on the bed, right? So I like to use like a canvas material. Um, uh, I like to use like a canvas material because the dogs generally don't want to go to the bathroom on that. Then if I'm not home, or I'm sleeping in the night, or I have to leave the house or whatever else, the dog is going to be in the crate. So now I've created a system where if I am home and I'm out with the dog, the dog is on place, or the dog is in the crate if I'm not home or I don't have the ability to look after the dog or watch the dog, so on and so forth. What I'm then going to do is the second I take the dog out of the crate, we are going to go outside. I'm going to give the dog a reasonable amount of time to go to the bathroom. If the dog goes to the bathroom, I'm going to mark and reward. Good job. You know, use a clicker, use a chip marker, whatever marker you got. Yes, reward the dog after they're done going to the bathroom. Don't try and do it before because a lot of dogs that really highly value the reward will actually curtail, you know, their pee or their poop and come for the treat. So let them finish or just about finish before you mark and reward. Then you're going to take the dog back inside if you are going back inside and you're going to put the dog on place. If the dog didn't go to the bathroom, you took the dog outside, they didn't go to the bathroom, guess what? You're gonna go back and put the dog in the crate because when you put the dog in the, oh, I should say this about the crate. The crate should not be gigantic. The crate should be appropriately sized to the dog and it should not have any bed in it. The crate should be just a plastic bottom, okay? And what's going to happen is the dog will then come in the house and if they're holding their pee or their poop, because they are waiting to come back in the house so that they can then go to the bathroom in that specific area they like going to the bathroom in, that is, now the dog is not gonna be able to do that. He's gonna be in the crate. And now he has two choices, either hold it or pee on himself. And most dogs do not like eliminating on themselves. If he's in a crate that is appropriately sized, he'll have no choice but to eliminate on himself or to hold it. If I really know the dog has to go to the bathroom, I'll leave them in the crate 10 minutes, then take them back outside, give them another opportunity. And usually at that point, they will do it. If they don't, I'll put them back in the crate, let them sit there for a half hour, and then give them a chance. If the dog eliminates on themselves in the crate, no problem. Most dogs won't do that more than a couple times before they say, man, that's unpleasant. I don't want to do that anymore. Let me take the opportunity to go to the bathroom when I am outside. All right? So we are going to now follow this process of crating the dog, using the place, and um, uh, uh, and taking the dog outside to go to the bathroom frequently until the dog develops the habit and the pattern of going to the bathroom outside. Dogs are pattern-based behave. They, they love patterns. They are pattern-based learners, right? Your dog has picked up a bad pattern of going into the house, and that's almost always a function of too much freedom in the house too quickly and allowing the dog to develop that pattern. The second you see that pattern, take all the freedom away, Lock everything down as I described. Follow this process until the dog is very comfortable and habitual in going to the bathroom outside. Then give the dog progressively more freedom. There are some dogs that, you know, can handle not going to the bathroom in the house when you're home, but when you're not home, we'll always go to the bathroom in the house no matter what you do. For those dogs, no problem. When you leave, crate the dog. There's nothing wrong with crating the dog when you leave. The other thing, of course, common sense. Don't give your dog a ton of water 
um, before you, you know, put them in the crate overnight. Or if you're going to work, don't give the dog like a ton of water and food and then, you know, expect that they're going to be able to hold it for a long period of time. You must use common sense, right? But this is fundamentally how you change it. Dogs are pattern-based learners. When your dog picks up a bad pattern, you must prevent them from um, uh, uh, enacting that pattern. You must you know, install containment systems that prevent the dog from, you know, uh, performing that pattern. And then you must create or force an alternate pattern that you find productive. And then you just go like that. Ronan says, I'm one of the people you're describing. I have a 21 month old Male, female German Shepherd, fully off-leash, functional, obedience trained with some work on sporty behaviors. I trained her from your YouTube and Patreon and book. Awesome, Ronan. That's fantastic. No, John, that is not booze. Strawberry says, stop smoking. Strawberry, the day I do something that someone on the internet, especially someone in the comments section that I don't know, um, the day I do something that somebody like that tells me um, to do, that'll be, that'll be a special day. Let me tell you, I'm going to enjoy and continue to smoke cigars. You know, it's interesting. Cigars really rub a lot of people the wrong way. I swear I could be smoking cigarettes and people wouldn't be as upset about it, but people really get upset about the cigars, man. Some people, not a lot of people, but some people, it just, I guess it offends them on some deep level. I don't know what it is. I think some people are just offended by seeing somebody enjoy something. And they feel the need to rain on the parade or pee in the Cheerios, so to speak. I enjoy cigars. I will continue to enjoy cigars. I will continue to smoke cigars on lives. If you don't like it, don't watch it. Somebody says their 11-year-old was bitten in the hand when their dog was playing with the ball with them. Uh, it's not a problem. And since you're in the off-leash course, I will answer your question. It's, it's very normal when high drive dogs are playing with the ball. I've been bitten, you know, you're, you're gonna get bit. Now, there's two ways this can happen. It can be an honest mistake. The dog really did not intend to do it. They thought your hand was the ball because you were whipping your hand around and the dog nailed you in the hand. Or the dog could be intentionally careless or actually have learned that if they bite you in the hand, they're gonna make you drop the ball, right? This is a different problem. For this, I will for sure correct that behavior. If it's an honest mistake, don't worry. Just carry on and be a little bit more careful. I just need to get him. Let me see. I don't read all the troll comments. Don't worry. I'm not going to need to drink. How do I work a sensitive dog with pressure without him shutting down? You teach him with incremental levels of pressure that shutting down is not the option, is not an option, it's not a solution to pressure. Your dog is simply offering uh, a solution to pressure that is not productive. When you teach the dog that this will not shut the pressure off, only doing the things that you need the dog to do will shut the pressure off, then the dog will stop shutting down. Do I sell green dogs to the public? Yeah, sometimes I do. But a lot of people think green dogs are cheap. They are certainly not. My dog will tolerate dogs he grew up with, but after he turned three years old, he now attacks any dog he can get close enough to. Completely unpredictable and unprovoked. How do I handle that? You make it a horrible experience for him and you stop allowing him to get close to uh, strange dogs and, and run up on them so that he can attack them. If you don't have that control over your dog, you really shouldn't be allowing your dog free. <laughs> this is this person. Sir, no mean to be rude. Like literally, I don't mean to be rude, but sir, please don't smoke because I'm really trying to help people, but you can drink, but just don't smoke. It's hurting you more. Jody, I think you need to uh, study the English language a little bit. You shouldn't be giving advice online if that is the grammar and syntax that your comments are taking form in. Uh, I am well aware of the risks, the health risks of smoking. I don't think that it's particularly good for you to do. Um, and believe me, drinking would be a lot worse for you than smoking. I'm not drinking. 
Um, I'm enjoying myself and I will continue to enjoy myself. Thank you. Uh, let's see what else we got here. How's Gage and his pups? Gage is great. The only pup I keep track of is Astro and he's great too. <laughs> Smoking is bad. Don't do it, please. No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, Rachel. Uh, what else we got here? What was the most... Sorry, guys. I'm just going to go through and see if there's any... Uh, Online members that I've missed. Benedictus, elite member in week three, intermittent e collar recalls. Do you stay at the slightly higher level the whole time, even when going back and proceeding the recall with Stim, or do you go back down? When I proceed the recall with Stim, I go back down. Um, but if it's going to be more of a consequence for not coming, I am up. Ooh, Chinese writing. I wonder what he's saying. Looks like spam. Has, are you holding in-person in -person classes soon? Thank you. Yes, we have many in-person classes available across all our locations. Check it out, shieldk9.ca. Um, we got Shield K9 Ottawa, Shield K9 Woodstock. You can see all our in-person classes there. Du, 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 du. Sorry, guys. I'm just looking. If I missed you. All right. Last question that I'm gonna answer. What's new with the Dutch Shepherd that you got from Holland? I can't remember his name. I think it was Mace. Nothing's new with him. It's been a long time since I had that dog. Uh, he is currently living in the US with his new owner. I hope they're doing well. All right, guys, thank you very much. It was, as always, a fun and interesting live. I'll see you guys on the next one.